Good evening. Um, so my name is Christina Juan, and I'm very happy to welcome you to SOAS. Uh, this is a great um, turnout. Uh, we're very happy uh, uh, to have you all here. The, uh, the evening uh, activities will be very casual. Um, we, we, it's not going to be very formal or anything, but it's really, um, <clears throat> it's really a chance to gather creative writers and sort of their enablers <laughs> um, for an evening of books and conversations about writing as Southeast Asians in the UK. Um, so tonight also is a chance for, for me to introduce a new initiative here at SOAS, which is called SULAT, or SULAT. <laughs> Uh, so Sulat at SOAS is a creative writing space that um, uh, is committed to discovering and supporting writers of Southeast Asian descent at, in the UK. So right now we are uh, starting to accept applicants for fellowships for uh, creative writing um, uh, fellows for the fall of 2018. Um, in that table over there is um, um, some flyers for you if you're interested, uh, some requirements and different things, and um, yeah, so we can deal with that later. Um, and um, so uh, without much ado, uh, let me begin the night uh, by introducing Elaine Castillo and her wonderful debut novel, uh, America is Not the Heart. Uh, so Elaine is a Filipina American and born in the San Francisco Bay Area. She graduated with a BA in Comparative Literature at uh, UC Berkeley and moved to the UK in the 2000s. Yeah. And uh, to do an MA in Creative Writing in, at Goldsmiths. Um, that was very helpful. <laughs> um, it was also in the UK that she wrote um, and finished the novel that we are celebrating today. So let me begin the night with her reading uh, of an excerpt from the book, and then we'll open up for questions. Yeah. Thank you, Christina, for that amazing introduction. And thank you all for coming out tonight. My god, what a turnout. And you guys all look gorgeous. So I just, I, I actually, this is very weird. I want to be taking photos of all of you. But thank you for coming out. I, as Christina said, I, I lived in London for about eight and a half, or England in about, for about eight and a half years and came here in 2009 and have since moved back to the Bay Area permanently. And it's quite surreal in a way to be back in the city that I spent sort of the better part of a decade in and what was once home. So I think it's always going to have a special place in my heart. So it's very good. It's, 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 it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here with all of you to celebrate, I suppose, the launch of this book, which was, yes, written and finished here. So I'm going to... I'm going to read uh, just, I think I'm going to read something basically as short as possible to, <laughs> so, that, so that we can all get to just sort of talking casually and chatting with each other and then all get back to our drinks, which is really what we want to do. Um, so uh, I, think, <laughs> I think all you need to know about this sort of short paragraph, or short um, passage, is that it's just told from the perspective of our main character, whose name is Hieronima de Vera. Um, she's also nicknamed Hero by her younger cousin. She's a former um, communist rebel, a former MPA rebel, so the New People's Army is the armed wing of the Communist Party of the Philippines. She is part of the NPA for around a decade and is eventually captured and um, kept in a prison camp for two years. And upon her release, shortly, uh, a couple of years after her release, eventually li lives in exile in California with her uh, uncle in the Bay Area in a town that's, the town that is essentially the town that I grew up in, in the kind of 90s, sort of Filipino suburbs of the Bay Area. So that's all you need to know for now. And another character mentioned, uh, her name is Teresa. Teresa is Hero's superior in the NPA. I want no prisoners, Teresa said to the cadres, quoting General Jacob Smith, who presided over the genocides in Samar. I want you to kill and burn. The more you kill and burn, the better you will please me. Smith, nicknamed Hell Roaring, introduced a system called reconcentration, segregating the common population from so-called revolutionaries by containing the former in what was called a reconcentrated zone. The point was to sever the guerrilla fighters from the rest of the civilian population, Teresa explained, depriving them of access to food, shelter, sympathy. The reconcentrated zone was placed under strict military surveillance and everything outside of the zone was treated as a no man's land. 
Anyone unlucky enough to be outside of its perimeter, maybe a parent or ex-lover was a revolutionary, maybe a sick relative lived on the other side, was shot on sight. Their bodies were left next to the homes that had already been raised, cattle that had been massacred, crops that had been left to decay. Let no livelihood be salvaged from the earth. That was the official policy. Smith's fellow general, J. Franklin Bell, carried out a similar campaign in Batangas. According to his own calculations, over 600,000 Filipinos were killed within three years. Hero didn't know of any official Filipino calculations. Another word for what the Americans were doing, coined by a Republican congressman, was pacification. Bell bragged that he'd found the secret of pacification. They never rebel in Luzon, because there isn't anybody there to rebel. President McKinley was more succinct. He called it extermination. Hero didn't learn any of those words at school. What she did remember from her time in school was a painting by El Greco, the Greek Spaniard who produced portraits of saints and messiahs and royals. The teachers in Hero's Catholic school mostly practiced the kind of two-face Padre Damaso style authoritarianism that had passed for pedagogy in the archipelago for over 300 years, abstemious piety with a touch of fondling, but they would occasionally extend their lessons to art when the artwork subject was religion. El Greco's work passed educational muster in Bigan, and so when Hero was around 10 years old, she saw the first and only painting she ever loved. Her teacher showed the class a portrait of Jesus that Hero hadn't ever seen before. Nothing like the blandly virile one her father Hamin hung next to the more traditional pastorals, in it Ju Jesus dewy and muscular like a Hollywood idol. The El Greco had been painting around the time Magalat was or organizing his revolt in Cagayan, that wasn't how the teacher framed it, but years later, Hero drew the two things together, looking for a familiar face in the foreign frame. In the painting, Jesus was raising two long anemic fingers in greeting or postponement, and he had strabismus, a quality her yaya used to spout about as a feature shared by mystics, geniuses, themes, imaginative children, and those possessed by capres. One, I looked the world in the face, the other, I needed a break and wandered off. The teacher said the name of the painting was El Salvador del Mundo, El Salvador del Mundo. But in no painting had, ever seen, had Hero ever seen anyone look less like a savior of the world. The expression of Jesus in the painting was one of grievous humility and reticence. His face was hollow-cheeked and wan, and in his gaze was the inconsolable calm of someone who had long ago reconciled himself to the knowledge that the world was totally unsavable. For years, Hero thought the title was meant to be ironic, but only in California did Hero remember the painting again and finally realize what she hadn't been able to know back then, what the face in the El Greco painting actually looked like. It just looked like an adult, someone who'd once been a kid and wasn't one anymore. Thank you. So, um, thank you. So let's begin with um, sort of, so um, feel free to um, ask questions, those who read the book, uh, the proof of the book. But I'll, I'll start with a few questions um, and then, um, yeah. So let's begin with the title of the book. Um, if you're Filipino, you're probably familiar with America is um, uh, the Bulusan book that I, I think every single Filipino American has probably read, maybe. Uh, in the States, uh, not so much here, I guess. But um, can you tell us um, how you chose the title and then, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I think or originally, originally it wasn't the kind of, kind of grand intertextual ambition that I think it probably now, in a way, per performs that. Ultimately, I think, not to traffic in cultural stereotypes, but <laughs> being Filipino, I like a pun. So basically, whenever I would hear someone say the, the title America is in the heart, Bulosan's title, I always sort of heard it as America isn't the heart. So for me, it was always just a kind of joke that I used to say to myself, oh, America isn't the heart. So I think because that was a little private joke, I, I thought to myself, okay, one day I'll, that'll, that'll be the title of something. And of course, that's why the, the last chapter is America isn't the heart with the conjunction. 
So ultimately, it really just came out of a kind of private joke. But of course, you know, I, I mean, as Christina said, the Bulosan is a kind of foundational text of Filipino-American history, of kind of ethnic studies in, in, in sort of um, college, college and high school pedagogy. I think it should be required reading for American history for all students. I mean, it's, uh, for people who don't know it, sort of Bulosan, the, the America is in the heart sort of follows the sort of experiences of largely Filipino but also Mexican migrant laborers on the west coast of the United States in the 30s and 40s and really sort of catalogs the kinds of extremes of poverty and exploitation and discrimination and state violence and white supremacy and police brutality that they experience um, that 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 is all sort of cataloged in a really, I mean, ultimately uh, dystopic, sort of relentless in prose. Um, it, it also features, in, in a way that I, I think is often less talked about, a kind of uh, apocalyptic sense of misogyny in that the book is also rife with femicides, female uh, w abuse of women, w female rape, um, in ways that I, I, actually, I, I think are problematic in the book. I don't know that uh, Bulosan's narrator I think there are problems with the ways in which women are represented in the book and the ways female interiority is represented in the book and how Bulosan's narrator contends with the kind of violence against women that, that he sees around him. But ultimately, you know, it's still, it's still I think, you know, especially as Filipino-American writers, we're all kind of daughters or kids of, of that book. And, I, you know, if you're a kid of that book, you also have the right to tussle with your parents. So... But it's still, a, you know, it's, it's still a, a book that's very important to me. Also because it was the first book that I ever read that took, uh, that had narrators, uh, the narrator, people who are from Pangasinan, because that's where my, my mom's family is from, and who, who, had, who grew up with the kind of abject rural poverty that my mom came out of in Pangasinan. Because at that point, I'd read a lot of Filipino-American and Filipino literature, but it was largely about kind of wealthy manileños, sort of urban, sort of educated. And it, for me, it was the first time that I ever saw rural, Philippine rural poverty that sounded like the stories my mom and grandmother used to talk about. Um, you seem to write in a very sort Sorry. of unapologetic way in terms of um, your heritage. So like if, if you've read the book, you see that a lot of it is in Tagalog, for example, or in the, in the native language, and sh you don't seem to take too much effort to translate them or, or maybe like um, right to, for, a, for a Western audience. Um, is this deliberate or is this something that you think um, is sort of a, a way forward for Southeast Asian writers? I, I, I definitely think it's a combination of being absolutely deliberate and then also absolutely natural. I mean, the town that I grew up in in California, Milpitas, which is also the town where most of the book, a lot of the book takes place, has been as long as I can remember for, for many years, a majority minority town. It's, it was a largely Filipino, Vietnamese, Mexican, sort of Taiwanese community. I think something like 60% of the inhabitants speak a language other than English. And I personally, you know, my mom spoke Pangasinan, my dad spoke Ilocano, they spoke Tagalog, Filipino to each other, and of course there was English for me. And I spoke in a way, uh, aside from Ilocano, because my actual, my father's family didn't really live near us, I spoke a kind of combination or heard a kind of combination of all those languages pretty sort of intuitively. In a way, Pangasinan was my first language, but there was always kind of, the, the borders between these languages were always extremely porous, and nobody in my family was sort of translating things. Like, it just, that was just the kind of banal reality that, you know, you would start a sentence in maybe Tagalog, but there would be a Pangasinan, a Pangasinan word in it, but then I would respond in maybe Pangasinan in English. And that was just how language operated in my home. And it was how language operated in a lot of homes in my town. And so for me, that's just a, that's just a picture of, a partic of a, an American reality. And the fact that it's not an American reality that we see depicted as, you know, sort of em em emblematically Californian, that really has to do more with our kind of mainstream ideas of what gets to be considered Californian or what gets to be considered American. And so for me, you know, writing in a way, trying to be faithful to the kinds of the kind of material sort of linguistic landscape that you know I, I know very well means not translating words it, it it means also not assuming that there's the primacy of a reader is uh, apparently is, is going to be some like non-filipino speaking or ultimately the dog whistle word here is really hiding assuming to be a white reader and i'm just simply not writing for the kind of primacy or comfort of a white reader i'm not interested in making 
my fiction or my sort of writing process palatable in that way or deforming it in that way for the comfort at the cost of then writing fiction that is not commensurate to the realities that I come out of. And I think that that impulse, that compulsion that, you know, Southeast Asian writers or any writers who are writing in multiple languages or coming out of multiple sort of language threads are, are, are made to feel that they have to flatten those realities is really ultimately toxic to literature and it's an insult to, you know, the idea that any of us think about literature, which is, you know, a, a republic, it's a place where you, you, you it, it can be commensurate to the kind of realities that we, you know, just that we live in our lives, in our voices, in our families, so. Sorry, I think I got a question over here. Yeah, yeah. It's telling that both of those writers are also men. <laughs> I mean, I do think, I think the, 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 uh, thank you for that question. I think that's a really good point and a kind of, in a way, a good sort of way to think about how we think about both national identity and kind of self-identity and also kind of our romantic relationships to national identity. For me, I think the, the, the way in which I might be talking, having a conversation with Carlos Bolosan's America is in the heart is the ways in which, like for I don't, people who haven't read it, there, 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 there are kind of two alternate endings I always find in Bolosan's work. There's the actual ending of the book, which ends sort of very optimistically, and it has a kind of line that, you know, the dream that we had of America will never sort of die, I'm paraphrasing, despite the kind of, sort of like long litany list of the kinds of violences that they've all sort of experienced. But the previous chapter really ends with a kind of grim, pessimism and loss and reckoning with uh, the kind of both loneliness and sort of self erasure that he's experienced. And for me, I, I, I think I, I, have, I have contentions with the idea that I think like national idea, that national identity, that there are certain sort of sort of markers of sort of Americanness or, or particularly maybe the, the kind of hopes of assimilation and keeping sort of countries in our heart that I think are, are there to be contended with, particularly because of the kinds of state violences we're talking about. The, the passage that I read talks about, you know, American genocide in the Philippines, which is not talked about enough, about, about the ways in which the American colonial project in the Philippines was absolutely devastating to the Philippines, but also completely crucial to what we would think of now as, you know, American empire, American statecraft. There's no sort of America that exists today without what you know, Americans did in the Philippines at the turn of the century. So for me, it's really about pushing back about that, at that idea that countries live in our hearts. Because for most of us, especially those of us who are marginalized in any way or who experience the kind of state discrimination and violence that Bulosan's characters and that, you know, my characters in this book experience, the idea of a country being in your heart is really actually morally untenable. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. I mean, they were talking about sort of, yeah, of course, they were talking about socialism and communism and how it was working in Spain in that period. But I think I'm still talking about, I mean, that's the, the phrase is still Spain in my heart. And as a Filipino, that's a phrase that will never come out of my mouth unless I'm quoting other people. But, you know, I, I still think that these kind of romantic ideas of sort of, large, sorry, do you want to No, go, 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 no, go, go, go. Are ultimately really ones that we have a responsibility to, to contend with. But thank you. So let's kind of shift towards the UK and, and writing as a Southeast Asian in the United Kingdom, for example. So um, uh, I was curious, what sort of factors or, I, or, or things that were in the UK that kind of pushed you towards writing the novel, uh, being an American, but then living in the UK? Was there anything in the UK that kind of encouraged you to write it or to finish the novel? Was there any... Uh, which might be of interest to people who are creative writers here in the UK? Um, well, I think I pro probably I'm just living the cliche that many, many, many writers live, which is the minute that you sort of exit the place that you grew up in or the kind of context that you grew up in, your hometown, suddenly you find yourself writing about it. Which, I mean, I, it, it does happen to a lot of writers, you know, writers who write, who, who write this amazing regional literature about the particular space that they're from often don't write it in, in the actual place that they're talking about. And I, I think it must be because it gives a kind of objective 
distance, a kind of space with which to think about the kinds of sort of historical and social and emotional sort of threads that go into making that place, you know, in ways that you couldn't when you're right there in the thick of it. So I think London must have given that to me. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, I, th I think so. I think that kind of space. I mean, obviously, I, I did do an MA here. I, to be honest, did not love my time there. And I think that I, I shared that experience with a lot of young writers of color who experienced just the kinds of kind of casual, unfortunately, kind of institu institutional racism and re reluctance to talk about sort of writing and literature, not just through lenses of, is this sentence pretty? Does it work on the page? Or what are the kinds of in a sense, sort of ethical and, in a sense, political implications of the ways I'm depicting, for example, you know, people from Pangasinan. I mean, there was, I, I remember there was a story by another uh, student who was, act, that was actually about Pangasinan, or, and the person was not from Pangasinan. And it was quite um, very, uh, quite a class shaming, uh, quite a classist and sexist piece in ways that, you know, I, I, I wanted to talk about. But I think often in creative writing spaces, there can be resistance to bringing in that, level of conversation when you know we have this kind of idea that liter liter literature should just be this kind of pure neutral space but the, really the only people who are able to benefit from literature being a pure neutral space are the people who have access to the kind of institutional generational power that passes as neutral which tends to be white people <laughs> it just does okay <laughs> so let's open up uh, to questions from the audience I, I mean, I think you should talk to a lawyer. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that, that is outrageous. No, I, I, think, I think you're, I mean, I, I, I have to say I am lucky enough that I, I don't have contracts that are that exploitative. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't self-publish. No, I published with Viking, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House. And uh, you, you should maybe talk to my agent, who's in the audience. You can. <laughs> yes, I, well, I'm, get, I'm, I'm being well paid I'm, and well compensated for my writing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not well paid in the sense of like I'm not. I'm not fucking. I'm not Peter Thiel. No, I didn't. I didn't say twenty five percent, and I'm not. I, I'm not getting into sort of figures now. Also, because I'm literally incapable of remembering figures, which is why I work with words. But I think you're right. No, no, no. But I think you're right. I think this discussion does have to be had about you know compensation around art, and you know because I know especially especially in my sort of earlier career, especially younger writers. There's loads of younger writers who get very much exploited, whose work is not paid for, for example, freelance writers, or who work for free, who work for free for online publications, and who don't have the tools to say, to advocate for themselves that their work deserves to be compensated. Also because we have this kind of fake romantic idea that we're doing it for the art, that we're not putting food on the table, that we're not actually trying to sort of, you know, fulfill, you know, sort of take care of our material realities. So, I mean, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, I, I think the idea that writers of color are in some are in some way being compensated for are in some way being compensated for the pasts of sort of American state colonialism is ultimately a fairly racist idea. But uh, if, it, if, it were, if it were true in any case, if it were true in any case, I would welcome that kind of state reparations. 
Which is why I, th I think you should probably see a lawyer. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Candy. I'd love to talk about her. Yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very novel idea. <laughs> Where's the end of this sentence going, guys? <laughs> and I have nothing to say. Oh, be really pulling. I read it and I couldn't put it down. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, right. well, no, thank you. you should read the book. you for that, first of all, the incredible kindness that just preceded that amazing question. Um, so yes, the prologue of the book is not written from the perspective of the main character. And the prologue of the book is, the, is encompasses the first words of the book that I wrote in, in the summer of 2013. So it's told by the, from the perspective of Hiro's aunt, um, who grows up in very similar to Bulosan, abject rural poverty in Pangasinan. And it sort of follows her, sort of her poverty as a youth and then her eventual immigration to the United States as a nurse. And for me, I think, for the longest time, I thought I would maybe write the entire book, either from her perspective or from her daughter's perspective, Ronnie, um, who was born in the Bay Area. I think probably just quite simply because I, autobiographically, I share the most sort of details with those characters. I, like Ronnie, like Basa's daughter, sort of grew up in the Bay Area. Our parents did the same things. I kind of had the sense that I, I was more familiar with that world. And yet, I think, just when I continued trying to write it, the words just ended up being completely dead on the page. I just, I, despite the fact that so supposedly I, I, I know the worlds of those, those characters better, I, I think it was, I found myself being really sort of defensive because of that. I found, I found myself not really being able to continue writing from Paz's perspective because I found, I just, I, I, I protected her a little bit too much. And then Hero actually, Hero was a character that I think I'd been thinking about for a while. And when it sort of came to me that Hero was related to Ronnie, that Hero was going to come to Milpitas, the kind of world of the book opened up, even though I was profoundly, profoundly uncomfortable with writing from Hero's perspective, largely because Hero comes from a kind of class privilege in the Philippines that I'm not familiar with, for one thing, that I have a you know, huge critique of, for another thing, and that, you know, yeah, that, that, yeah, ultimately I just didn't want to write a, a book about a, a wealthy, uh, some rich girl. Um, but I think ultimately it ended up being that kind of discomfort that sort of ultimately sort of mistrust of her that allowed me in a way to be free with her, that allowed me to be vulnerable with her and kind of yank the rug out from her in a way that I wasn't at all able to do with, with Paz or with Ronnie. But the, the way the, I think exactly what you hit on, the way the kind of prologue, I think, functions in the book kind of formally or ethically is that it also kind of provides a framework. It's sort of like through this lens, in particular through this lens around class and her gender and her kind of experiences as a poor rural woman in the Philippines, that's the sort of filter through which everything in the book then has to be read, and because just throughout the book, Pass is actually quite a kind of reclusive, a kind of kind of recount, like sort of yeah, quite sort of sort of closed off figure. You don't actually know that much from her, and but it's it's because you know that backstory that then it's it's from that position that then you you move through what happens in the rest of the book. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Hi. I was wondering at what stage in your life did you think of the title in this book? 
Uh, well, yeah, so the, the, uh, as I was saying before, it, that title, America isn't the heart, with the conjunction, was some, something that has, it's just been a joke in my head for years, probably since I was about 14 or 15. And when I was writing the book, um, I think it had multiple titles, and I just thought that title would be the title of like a chapter or something. But it just sort of kept resurging in a way, and then I realized, I think sort of quite organically, sort of in the middle of writing the book, that that was the title of the book. For sure, yeah, I think so. I think, I think, I, I mean, obviously, the kind of genesis of it comes out of this joke around um, sort of Bulosan's title and how it's pronounced. But exactly as I was saying with my sort of previous interlocutor, I think for me, it's about pushing back against this, the idea that America or sort of these grand sort of sort of colossal sort of ideas of national identity are the things that we hold in us or the, 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 the kinds of things that we keep in our heart, as opposed to the kind of daily, material, banal, granular, like textural sort of realities of the kinds of lives of the people who populate this book, lives of the people who are in the kind of suburban, marginalized communities in the Bay Area. And if anyone is in the heart, or if anything is in the heart, it's in these kind of tiny, tiny sort of fragments and moments of how characters like those build lives with each other and build communities with each other. So I think, actually, sorry to belabor that point, but there's a, the epigraph of the book is, comes from Bulosan. And it comes from, it's a passage, it, the, the line of the epigraph is, I knew I could trust a gambler because I had been one. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't choose it because the book is about gambling. It's not a line about gambling. It, it comes at a point where um, the main character has to pawn off a ring in order to pay for sort of groceries for his sick brother. And so he pawns it off to someone who's a gambler. Um, and then he says this line, I knew I could trust this person, because I knew I could trust the gambler because I had been one. And for me, that very simple sort of line has always stood out as this kind of, I think, really searing portrait of what community actually is. That we don't actually make communities often with the best part of ourselves and the best part of someone else. That we actually make communities ultimately with sometimes the most vulnerable and sometimes untrustworthy parts of ourselves. That's the, the, the kinds of communities that can be formed when you think, oh, I, 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 I can place faith in what might be thought of as mendacious and untrustworthy and flawed in you because I know for a fact that those untrustworthy, mendacious and flawed parts are also in me. And so I think when we think about yeah, what is in the heart, then yeah, it is in the kinds of sort of dailinesses of building community in that way with the kind of, yeah, very sort of tender, banal, and flawed parts of each other. Well, uh, I haven't read the book, but I'm thinking of writing a book, and maybe you can help me. Oh, oh. I'll, 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 I'll get... Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, that's a pretty good, those are pretty two good poles to be divided between. <laughs> it doesn't sound that bad. Oh, wow, the opposite of my parents. Yeah. I, I found that they uh, utterly shaped my experience in, uh, as a Philippine American growing up in the Bay, but I completely agree that in a ways it was never talked about. I think there, there was a kind there, 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 you, you do experience sometimes a kind of flattening of nuance that happens when you're a marginalized community and so you, you're, you're, you're sort of 
you know, your priority is sort of forming solidarity, you know, forming solidarity where you can with people where you can. So I think that, and, and, and that is an understandable pose to take, and it's one that I, you know, I, I, I often take myself, but I, I do very clearly remember interactions with Filipino families who were from a class, of, you know, my, because my parents, I always say that my parents came from a very mixed class marriage in that, good. I always say that my parents come from a very mixed class marriage in that by the time I was born, my mom was a nurse, my dad was a security guard, so for all intents and purposes, it was a working class, sort of lower middle class family. But in the Philippines, you know, my mom had, as I said, grown up in poverty, and my father had grown up much more in comfort and was from a much more comfortable sort of upper middle class family. And I felt very acutely the kinds of differences in their formation that kind of shaped, just not, not even how they interacted with each other, but their sort of feelings about each other, their feelings about love, their feelings about themselves, and I 100% I felt the kind of, uh, essentially, exactly as you said, regional chauvinism and deep class chauvinism that I think does carry over to America, even if sort of first-gen Americans like me take their entire lives until adulthood to realize, oh, the way this person was treating, treating me was when, when I was a kid was because she thought I was from a lower class than her. And I think I tried to explore that a little bit in the book with the kinds of interactions that Ronnie has with a, with a classmate of hers who's, whose family comes from a wealthier uh, background and f by whom Ronnie is treated fairly badly without really understanding why? So I think for me it is important to think about class differences both within the Philippines and within Filipino American communities and how there is exploitation within the Filipino community based along sort of class lines and, and regions. So for me it's, it's, it's very sort of very, very foremost in my experience of you know, being Filipino and American. You got more questions about royalties? <laughs> I think actually we have to give it to someone else, yeah. yes. Mm. Yeah. Oh, California. <laughs> oh, wow, yes. Right. I was born in the States, yeah. Oh, for sure. No, for sure. I, I, I mean, I think, I think this, that's, that's an experience that a lot of ultimately diasporic kids and diasporic people sort of go through. And I think my generation, because I'm a first generation American, so I was born in America and my parents were immigrants. I think a lot of us sort of, the, 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 there's, a, there's a kind of discourse around, I think, my generation, which is like, we're stuck between two cultures and we don't belong in either place. And I think I probably, I'm just a contrary person, <laughs> but I've always a little bit sort of resisted that idea, that idea that in some way I'm, incomplete or incoherent because of the kind of, you know, sort of social material realities that, you know, made me born in America. For me, I always say I, I am Filipino-American. That's the kind of space I occupy. It's not a incomplete space. I, I don't even know if I would say it's a hybrid space. It's just a, a space of its own. I, I you know, I, 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 I had friends and, and that, that I love very much, and I respect this trajectory, but it was always kind of like, I, I need to go back to the Philippines to sort of like get in touch with my roots. And I, I, I really, I, I have a lot of love for that impulse, and, and I understand it, and I sometimes feel it too, but I think ultimately my roots are in the very shitty strip malls of the Bay Area, of the suburban Bay Area, and that is just this sort of, in a sense, authentic culturally as a kind of sort of imagined ancestral homeland that may ultimately actually be a kind of romantic fantasy. So for me, it's about sort of taking the kind of realities that make me and then understanding that that's, that's, a, that's a space, that's a, that's a co coherent sort of uh, identity. So I do feel, I do feel very Filipina American. I feel, you know, at times very Filipina. And when I'm in England, I feel very American. I think, I, I think probably you feel the same. Yeah, d yeah exactly. Dude, you, before you come to England, you never think you're like a loud person, but then you come here and you're like, oh, apparently I'm very loud and opinionated. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly, exactly. 
well, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, why are you, why are you actually having a human interaction with me? <laughs> so yes, I mean, for 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 sure, I I, I think those 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 kind of dailinesses are there. But I, I for me, I think as as diasporic sort of kids, you also you also want to think about how all of those pieces sort of are okay to just sit with each other and not necessarily need to kind of make a kind of a kind of perfect whole or have to you know that, that you don't have to sort of wrap it up in a bow that it's okay to be just in that 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 sort of mixed up place yeah thank you for that question thank you Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I I think I think well for me just just personally, you know, it was important for me to depict queer characters and in particular bi characters and bi women of color because I'm a bi woman, I'm a bi woman of color. I I would like to see more depictions of bi women and 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 sort of bi women of color, bi Filipinas in in our media. I think bi erasure is 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 a real thing. So for me, yes, it was very important to sort of depict the kind of yeah, the kind of mundane kind of realities of of queer women's and queer Filipino queer immigrant women's lives. And I think important also to depict it in a way that doesn't kind of center. I think a lot of there was someone was asking me about you, you, the the queer characters in your book, they're never sort of like wrestling with or deciphering their sexuality. Like why was that? And I always think, well, do you ask hetero writers, well, these hetero characters are never sort of wrestling with or deciphering their sexuality. So why should I assume the kind of primacy of hetero readers or the kinds of sort of like knee-jerk heteronormative sort of assumptions we make about whose sexuality needs to be deciphered and whose gets to pass as kind of unspoken and neutral and thus normalized. So for me, it, it's important for me to write about, you know, queer women who are immigrants, queer women who are undocumented, queer women who are suburban and who are ultimately non-western um i think i'll you know because a lot of you know a lot of the queer fiction that i love and you know was formative for me growing up a lot of it is sort of urban or western or about sort of like the rural or the suburban is the place that i have to leave in order to sort of be realized and that's a very real trajectory that you know i i i've also experienced but i i also know i also know personally that's not every queer pe person's story so i'm also i think interested in depicting the kinds of sort of Mm, I guess multi-varied realities of, of of queer life in which you know in which you know it's like I, I think I mean even queer as a term for me that's a term that came to me sort of pretty late in my life and late in my sexuality as a, as, as a term that's ultimately to me has always sort of telegraphed a kind of academicness and a kind of ultimately also sort of whiteness because there was a lots of sort of queerness and gender queerness. I mean, Filipino people know that there's a lot of sort of very sort of playful sexuality in Filipino culture. There's also obviously a lot of very sort of rampant homophobia, transphobia, and sort of structural discrimination um, around sexuality. But there's also, you know, especially in the pre-colonial sexuality of the Philippines, a lot of, you know, very interesting sort of gender queerness and sort of, and, and, and sexualities that, you know, that, that, that disrupt our notion of kind of hetero and queer. So for me, I think it's also about thinking about characters who, whose, whose kind of journey is not necessarily the kind of Western, I guess, sort of trajectory of you know of coming out of using certain types of language to identify themselves as queer but you know just thinking about the kind of fullness of queer lives you know like there that are that come out of the community like the one I came out of can you can you give us a little bit about the process in writing this book like the editors like how how did you interact with the editors when you were trying to make this book yeah um, how hard were you against Edits. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the first draft of the book that was, uh, by some miracle, sold was um, a thousand pages. So that was a very, very long book because I think apparently at the time I just didn't believe in side characters. I, th I think, I, I, you know, every single character, anyone who set foot in the book was sort of like you had to have their entire history, the entire history of their town, the entire history of both their parents and which is obviously oppressive for a reader. But for me, you know, I, I love context. I always think there's this beautiful, yeah, the, I, I just love context, essentially. But then eventually I did sort of, you know, you do realize that readers do not need to know all that information. They don't need to know that you did your homework that well. 
you just, you, you, so you ultimately, I, I think I sort of realized that I'm the type of writer who writes the world first. I don't know if there are writers who sort of re relate to that, but you write the world, and then from that point, you know, you kind of write your way, you find the book in that. So I think that's the type of writer that I discovered that I am in the process of writing this. And as for editing, I mean, I, I think I was much more ruthless an editor than my editors expected in a way. I think they, they did for sure want the 1,000-page book to, I mean, obviously there are some cuts you can make in a 1,000-page book, but I don't think they quite anticipated how much I was ready to cut. And I think one editor was a little bit alarmed. It was like, I, I, I bought a big book and you're now acting like it's going to be a novella. So I, what is this, now? this is something like 400, 400 from something thousand. from a thousand. Yeah. So I, I, I stripped, I was, I was fairly ruthless, um, in the editing, which I like, I mean, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm quite clear eyed about that. And as for sort of the editing process, um, you know, I had two editors cause I was working with the U S editor who was the sort of lead or main editor. And then I was working with a UK editor because I was here. Um, I was living in the UK, which made sense at the time. And I mean, it was really, I, I, was, I was very, very lucky with the editors that I had um, who are both white, which is the, you know, the norm for much of publishing, unfortunately, is still a largely sort of white dominated industry, um, which is something that I think many writers and many people are sort of um, taking contention with about the need for kind of structural change within publishing largely. Um, but I was very, very lucky to have two editors that were really ready to, that not only were like hugely supportive of the book, but were really ready to, engage i think with the project of what the book was trying to do and then how to edit that book so for example there was from one editor some sort of hesitance and pushback around the kind of sort of untra all the untranslated words in 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 the book and sort of that editor sort of sort of fear that maybe it would be sort of too alienating for writers and i really had to in a sense sort of explain myself and my reasons and sort of push back and say, no, this is why it's important both aesthetically and ethically um, to, for, the, for the book to remain this way and ultimately editing it that way will be a disservice to the kinds of sort of the things that I'm trying to do in the book. And I was lucky enough that I had an editor that was ready to step up, that was ready to go, okay, well, I will be on board for that project. I will support the, the kinds of things that you're you know, trying to do as a writer, which I, 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 having heard from other stories from other writers, especially other writers of color, is, is not always the case. So I was very lucky with the editors I had. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That creates a kind of intimacy immediately in the reader. What were you thinking when you first started to write Sonic Fury? I mean, I, I, I agree with the, the kind of intimacy of the second person. The second person has always been a mode that I've really loved. It's always been a mode that I always was, it was always part of my personal canon, the kind of readers that I loved growing up. Sort of, Jama I don't know if people have read Jamaica Kincaid's. Um, girl, which is a masterpiece, she uses it. Lots of sort of, it's, it's a mode that I often associated with kind of, I think, immigrant writers and writers of color and sort of writers in translation, that it was quite sort of, to me, I was always thought it was a canonical mode, which is why I was very surprised when sort of the book started coming out and people started sort of asking like, whoa, like brave choice, the second person, it's not a very kind of literary mode, like people don't like the second person. I was like, what, really? But then I think that in, in a sense is a kind of ultimately, I think it's called kind of revealing of what we think about what constitutes sort of, in a way, legitimate literary language or legitimate literary discourse. I think a lot of our kind of conventional ideas of what a novel looks like or sounds like is like, it's told in a very stately voice in the third person, you know, in the kinds of sort of like sort of like large social realist sort of descriptions, which is kind of fiction I love and which actually mo most the rest of the book sort of takes place in that voice. But I never had the sense that, you know, the second person was in any way a kind of degraded voice, which I think some people do. I, it, it's a voice that I love because, I, as you said, that there's a, there's a kind of intimacy to it, an immediacy to it. And there's also I think you can play with time. I think you can play with tenses and uh, I think that kind of spatio-temporal dimension of, of, of people's lives in a way in, in the first person or in the second person. That's quite difficult to do in the first person and the third person. So in the second person you can sort of jump around, you can sort of fast forward and rewind in ways that allow you to kind of be in the interior of a character's conscience but then also kind of sort of go into the micro and then kind of blow out into the macro. Um, in ways that that, that that form really allows you to be flexible with. So I love it.
Do you use it all throughout? No, I don't use it all throughout. I, I mean, I, I probably, I think probably because of what I was saying earlier about not really being able to continue just, just to sustain Pas's voice. I just found myself increasingly becoming defensive and kind of not allowing, not wanting her to be vulnerable in the sense because I was protecting her. So that's probably why it just stopped there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All second person. All second person. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thank you. I've taken notes now. I, I, I've taken your orders down. <laughs> One last question before we go to the panel and maybe have a bit more wine. Oh. If there's any left. Yes. Just, I'm really curious uh, what commercial accommodation, if any, was done because uh, in the end you have to sell the books. Sure, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. I, 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 I'm sure that is done to some writers, but I was very lucky to have editors who, for one thing, believe in literature, believe in the primacy of literature and the importance of literature, and believe that literature will find its readers. So no, I didn't have editors who pushed me in any way on that, on that front. Except for the length of the book, no? No, I think I, I probably I was much more ruthless with that. I think they would have been okay with a longer book, and I was like, no, guys, those two hundred that that chapter you liked is gone. <laughs> so. Yeah.
meaning to you, you know, you know everyone's been crying, and it just becomes this incredible and part of a place where you feel a certain rootedness, not necessarily to a country, but to a certain place or house. And um, it, it's been replaced by um, uh, condos.
crucial part of not just our memories and their nostalgic goals, but also uh, the discovery of identity. I think um, interacting with second generation Filipinos abroad, for example, uh, it is quite a part of the way they discover their history and history of the parents. So, um, and it is a particularity, I think, that feeds into, um, let's just say all people move, you know, humans have always moved, we will always do this in the world. But how we locate ourselves as Filipinos um, and other nationalities of um, diasporic populations um, comes out in the uniqueness of aspects of our lives. So it's not just talking about moving and what we found at the other end. That whole movement and how we adapt and how we remember where we came from manifests itself in food, among other things. Um, so how do we talk about where we came from and how we found ourselves in the other society? It's not just, just talking about our histories, but about other aspects of our existence, you know, eating, um, the social aspects of um, food, which is quite prominent in Southeast Asian culture. It's not just about eating out, it's not about fast food, it's about family, for example, and sharing. Um, there's also hunger, you know, um, the experience of scarcity, um, which all goes into that whole narrative about food, which is why it's such a rich mind for uh, people who write in Nathan, Nathan, you're writing a literary blog, but you've got recipes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as a food blog, a little bit, it's kind of weird, but that kind of makes sense. Why, why are you doing that? I just love eating. <laughs> Literature in Southeast Asia. <laughs> I 
had never been taught to think that <coughs> Southeast Asians had a, a, a written literature, that there was any kind of, and so it, it does, I'm, I'm always visiting that, that you know, God forsaken prologue. <laughs> 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 I'm not rich. 
British. I was born in Australia. I came here as an immigrant in Lebanon. I've lived in Singapore for five years. I've lived in France. Um, and so I've been an immigrant many times. And when I go back to Australia, everybody thinks I'm English. They treat me as a Brit. I get uh, treated as a pony. And uh, when I was in Singapore, they all treated me as a Brit. You know, so I got all that sort of anti-colonial shit. And I thought, well, I grew up in Australia. So you were kind of ahead of the curve, weren't you? Publishing diverse books before anyone else had even begun to see the hashtag. And um, can you tell us, because a lot of people criticizing that movement say, well, the reason there's, there are no diverse books is because they don't sell. Do they sell, or has it been a struggle? And what, what, what stands in the way um, of success? You don't make any money out of it, no. Uh, my husband is mixed race. how my thinking about writing has changed. I've only kind of recently been writing fiction, for example. I've always written poetry, even when I lived in the Philippines. Um, but um, that kind of, uh, the moving somewhere else, I think, triggered something. Um, <laughs> like what Elaine said, <laughs> um, Well, first of all, the commentary uh, about political <coughs> politics um, is getting harder and harder to write. Um, because satirical writing in particular requires that you master all aspects of that particular thing. You cannot satirize something if you don't know all aspects. You're just going to fall flat. Um, second of all, I think um, moving to a country like here, which I did not plan to do in the first place. <coughs> I was just here for a year to study and then life happened. Um, was also, uh, to me, a unique experience. Everyone in my family who moved abroad moved to the US. Um, and there is kind of a monoculture going on there about the diaspora. It's, it's, it's the kind of goal to move. Uh, it's the aspirational thing if you're in the Philippines. Nobody thinks of moving to India. 
Um, well, at least nobody did <laughs> when I was growing up. Um, well, sure, they speak English there, but really, you know, where is that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I remember watching this film, uh, The Full Monty. Um, and I was like, oh, is this an island? You know, I, I, I had no idea about Sheffield, and of course, I never imagined that I would end up there studying. And when I landed there, so I don't speak English after all, mm -hmm. you know, and my own, not, not my own illiteracy, but it was just shocking to kind of come across the language again in this context. And so I think that has triggered something about wanting to write, um, not just about my personal experience, but in also kind of being a migrant community <coughs> in a semi-familiar situation. Um, which came, which I'd already experienced previously when I lived briefly in Jakarta, for example, and in Thailand. Um, everybody kind of looks like you. The language in Indonesia, of course, sounds very similar, not just with the but the Ilocano, uh, northern language. But yet, I couldn't understand a thing anyone was saying. I could pick out words. So it, it was very strange. Um, it sounds familiar, but it's com completely different. And um, as a Southeast Asian, I also only got to see synthesize the kind of experience and not really talking just about my own thing but stories really telling it's stories really interesting about. concept of the Southeast Asian writing because Southeast Asians themselves like me as a Filipino I never thought of myself as Southeast Asian mm -hmm. until I started to read to read more about our, our pre uh, colonial history and realize that we were all kind of bonded together but that's very recent it's like within the last six months so <laughs> you know I don't, I don't know She's uh, Elaine's literary agent. If you want to have a big advance, uh, become famous <laughs> and do book tours. I'm talking a big game. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, then uh, you, you need to get to know Emma. <laughs> also, be kind. Don't follow her to the bathroom. She's going to go later. I'll tell you. Um, so, Emma, um, I want to ask you, as a literary agent, do you get a lot of manuscripts like Elaine's to the door? to look them up um, and they are used by writers who are looking for representation 
um, and and I try to look at absolutely everything that comes to me by email. Um, but I also, you know, I try to find the time to take a much more proactive approach to um, finding new voices in fiction and in non-fiction. Um, and so that involves um, going to readings like the one where I was lucky enough to encounter Elaine. Um, oh, you met her? Can you tell us yeah. about that? How did you yeah, no, I'd discover love to tell you about that? <laughs> um, uh, was it Um, is that better? No? Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Um, so, in 2014? 2014. In 2014. No, no, it wasn't 2013, because I, I joined in 2013, and it was... Early 2000. Anyway, whenever it was... Sorry, guys. Fascinating contribution. Um, when, whenever it was, I went to. It's actually one of those evenings where you've kind of got it scheduled. It's sorry, it's diarized, and then I, you know, you don't necessarily want to go. You'd rather go home. But anyway, I forced myself to go with a colleague of mine who I still work with. Um, and the way those um, showcases work, if you haven't been to one before, is that you you get given something like this with. Um, the name of the writer and uh, the name of the excerpt that they're reading, um, and you sit through a lot of um, a lot of writers, maybe 20, 25, a lot of writers, um, and sometimes you leave halfway through. Um, and luckily, I stayed till the end because I think you were right, almost right at the end. And um, I'm sorry to embarrass you, but um, really, as soon as Elaine started reading from what is now the prologue in this novel, the kind of energy in the room shifted, like completely changed. And you can feel other people feeling that in the audience. Anyway, so my a colleague and I were writing notes to each other, and we both wrote a note. I can't remember what it was, but it was basically like, you know, we've got to go and speak to her um, and and then at the end we did and then it sort of happened from from there um, so so a lot so it was it was the, the, the voice that got you well I think yeah absolutely the voice also the kind of um, there's something that happens on the page in Elaine's work but there's something else as you were all lucky enough to hear that happens in the there's a kind of oral quality to it that not every prose writer has um, and that was communicated so forcefully and immediately in this reading um, so and you just sort of know in the same way that when you open a book in a bookshop when you're maybe thinking about what to buy you know really really quickly if it's the writer that you want yeah, to... Yeah, but what about all the weird language and the pangasina yeah. and the food and the, all the weirdness <laughs> of the Filipino mess of the book? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, to be honest, it never, it, it never crossed my mind. It just, you know, I'm not kind of... That's not a... That's a totally authentic statement. I just, you know, I see... I think the role of the agent in... The, on both the business side and the creative side, or the way I see it, is one of facilitation. Um, so on the business side, that's about finding, a, you know, getting the author a deal and finding an editor, finding the right editor. And on the creative editorial side, if you are an agent who, who engages editorially before the work is taken out to editors, um, it's about sort of asking questions and um, saying, you know, clarifying in conversation what is it that you want to, to do here what are you trying to achieve what's your vision and how best can how best can we talk about it editorially in order for you to execute that vision it's never about imposing um it, it's all about the integrity of the work and the internal logic of the work it's never about imposing um i, I don't know com some kind of market imperative that you might have in your mind for me so but there's hope. Yeah, I hope so. You can put in all your weirdness as long as you've got a voice. Yeah. Right. So we've got to go talk yeah, yeah. to RJ now. Um, so RJ published uh, a, uh, she published two books now so yeah. far. And they're photography books. They're stories told in a different way. And the first one was by Tommy Halfala, right? 
and this is a photographer who visited um, the Cordillera Mountains to, rep to document uh, life and culture in the, in the mountains. Um, this is the setting of my forthcoming novel, coming out in August. <laughs> I'm launching the book on the 13th of July, here in SOAS. Anyway, okay, just a little <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, But what's really in what really interested me was how he talked about how change was so fast. Every time he came back, everything changed. And I was really, really struck by that. When I was researching my book, I would, because my book is set in 1899, uh, pre-American invasion. Um, and everyone I interviewed about cultural practices that I found recorded in anthropological texts would say, oh, we're Christians now. We don't do that anymore. Like they were ashamed of it. Like they had been made ashamed of those practices that they had done. And I'm very curious, could you talk about how Tommy Halfala created this documentation over, over three years? How many years? Um, well, he started in 1978, but the book spans 1981 to 2004. I think 2000, no, 2001, so 30, 30 odd years, and they're not Christian anymore, they're now Episcopalian. Yes. <laughs> so, um, Is that different from Christian? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. No, yeah. but I, I think yeah, that, that, um, I think Tommy approached it from a, from, I would call it like a history from below, because a lot of the observations, unlike, unlike photographic history, um, a lot of the representations still that exist still tend to come from from a Western perspective. So this is one of the you know I, I imagine or I, I'd like to think more authentic voices that he believes that he um, sorry I'm, I'm trying to fumble with my words. It's, it's it's more like a history from below, where instead of people observe the, the you know outsiders observe what they would call the tribes, it's the people giving, you know, Tommy giving them, you know, opportunity to explain what it is that they believe in, mm -hmm. rather than an outsider's perspective. Are there, I haven't seen the book, which I'm desperate to own. Mm -hmm. um, does it have, like, captions and... Um, yeah, the details, is it the, the captions are quite detailed, and a lot of it um, wants to sort of talk about the misrepresenta misrepresentation of the people um, for, for a long time, about you know, the beliefs that people uphold, um, and, and yeah. Well, one of the difficulties of Southeast Asia and the Philippines is that it's not one culture. It's like Africa being constantly written about as if it's one country. Mm -hmm. and, the, the, and it's the same, like you just go to the mountains in the Philippines and you've got all of these tribes with very, very disparate mm -hmm. practices. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in the Philippines, we just lump it into one, one story. Yes. Um, he, he writes about, Quite a few tribes, doesn't it? So three, three or four are, are documented. So the Cordilleras co are composed of um, different regions. So, but then you would call them, like in Scotland, you would call them the Highland tribes. So this would be the Filipino version of the Highland <coughs> tribes. But then each different ethno-linguistic group, they're in divide, indeed divided by the language, have similar, but at the same time, you know, sort of little things that that differ, you know, that differ from each other. Is he from the from a tribe? He the... is from Ilocos. Okay. He's Ilocano, and but he is now accepted as one of the elders because throughout his documentation, um, the people there rely on on like an oral history, mm -hmm. and so he's the only one that's actually written down a lot of the prayers, a lot of the of, of the sequences of, of, of rituals. There's some rituals that only happen every ten years, so he's been lucky enough to been to have attended two or three, you know. Th three of those in the last 30 years, and elders now go to him because they don't remember what sequence <laughs> the rituals ago. Was there, was there any kind of feeling that he was appropriating their culture? Mm -hmm. in, in America, there's, a, there's a, a, an activism about cultural appropriation, which mm -hmm. is applied, you know, you might be American, <coughs> but you, you're not Native American, so you mustn't write in our voice, that's our voice, and you've been treating us badly all these years. Um, was there any kind of, because there's a, there, there is historical bad blood between the Ilo Ilocanos and the Cordilleras. Um, not at all. I think he, because of his, he is quite respectful of their practices and just wanted to document it objectively in some way. He, he did the work. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I was working 
as a printer, and at the time there was a resurgence in what you would call the photo book, um, the publishing of photo books. A lot of young publishers were coming to us for us to finish, you know, the books and the images that they worked on, and I decided that it was something that I could do in the Philippines, but at the same time also Southeast Asia. There is, you know, problematics and representation in both literature and photographic or visual um, publishing, that there's, you know, really a lack of voice, especially especially in photography or in the visual arts, I, I, I find. that I feel that literature has, has really come along further um, as opposed to uh, photographic representation of people. Um, so I thought it was something that I, I can do and I should do, so I have done. It's not easy. <laughs> for a friend. <laughs> um, well, there's, there's a lot of photographers, both in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia, that whose books need to be published that haven't been published. So you have a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. May I invite you, Elaine, to respond to what you have heard so far? And whether this, because you are, you are a, you're not a, you're a, you're younger than most of us. No. <laughs> and these are, we, we came before you. And we're all trying to tell our stories in all our different ways. Um, can you respond to what you've heard so far? I mean, I, I, I was just sort of listening in fascination to everybody. I love hearing all of these sort of different experiences and different ways of thinking about sort of our diasporas or our places that we come from. I really want this book, so please write down <laughs> that, 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 that title for me. Um, probably two things I think, I think I really agree with something that was said about the kind of that sort of tension and the kind of representation between what we might call East Asian, sort of East Asian community and Southeast Asian community. And that's, for me, I'm, I'm coming out of a largely Asian American um, sort of community and context. And it's something that I talk about often to other Southeast Asian friends. So you were asking, do I sort of identify as Southeast Asian? And I do only in, as a kind of identity of solidarity. And that like in my soul, obviously, yes, I'm Filipino American. My dad's a Lugano, my mom's Pangasinan. So that's actually the kind of, and I'm from the Bay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that, that's, the, that's the kind of sort of mopitas, exactly. That's the kind of sort of, I guess, subject positionality I, I come from. But I, I, I do sort of also stake out that Southeast Asian territory, I think if only because a lot of the times in, in our kind of representations of Asian America, it often does tend to be East Asian American. So the, the, in, in the kind of literature that's sort of, or literature or films or sort of representation where we have Asian representation, um, at least in America, it often largely tends to be East Asian American, largely middle class or upper, upper middle class, sort of increasingly also South Asian, but also largely middle class or upper middle class. And we see much, much, much less of sort of poorer working class Southeast Asians of the kinds that you know I, I, I grew up with and I'm, I'm familiar with. And, and I think it's, it's important to also sort of um, be uh, sort of both inclusive and nuanced when we think about sort of Asian American or a Asian American, those, those kinds of identities of solidarity. I mean, I think it's also important to talk about the kind of intra-exploitation within Asian communities, the kind of exploitations that, for example, Filipino laborers would experience in Singapore. Like that's not, you know, to, to not talk about all of those types of sort of dynamics and power dynamics and class issues is also then to kind of flatten the reality of sort of Asian life today and Asian history and for me it's it, so for me I think that that's that's really what some of a discussion like this is able to facilitate because then we can you know talk about all of the kind of different sort of angles that we're coming from it and then you have a, you have actually a kind of nuanced approach to thinking about you know Southeast Asian writing and the, 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 the Sulat and the kind of project that Christina very importantly is bringing to us and I think probably I would probably just end with thinking would agreeing wholeheartedly with what Emma said about you know the integrity of the writing being, being, being prime. Like really, sort of encouraging writers here. Obviously, there's no writers here, so I don't know who I'm talking. But any, in, in, right, in, oh, in, engaging with writers here. I'm just talking to you. Emma, that's uh, she's a writer. She's a writer. <laughs> engaging with that sense. So engaging with the writers here is to, 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 to have a really firm reminder to, to not be palatable, to not deform your writing or the project that you're doing for some kind of imagined, ultimately white sort of reader that's not you, that's not the people that you're writing about. So write only, the, write the thing that only you can write, write the thing that you most urgently have to write about because guaranteed that is going to be the thing that readers 
will respond to because that's because you feel that as a reader. I mean, all of us as writers, I think it's safe to say, are readers first and foremost, and we remember what it's like to read books that make you feel like. I mean, the word representation is actually, it, it, it's, it's a word that I often think is so impoverished. Like, it's like tolerance. Nobody wants to be represented. Nobody wants to be tolerated. These are very kind of poor words for thinking about the kind of visceral joy and sort of effect of, it, of, of seeing, seeing the Bay Area in fiction if you don't see the Bay Area that looks like yours in any kind of depictions of Californian life. I mean, depictions like that just, what, what they do really is to tell you, you are real which is to say, your writing is, the, the world you're living in is real, the people around you is real, the context, the reality, you know, the reality that you know, that is real. You know, like in, in our kind of mainstream culture, like white people don't ever need to be told that they're real, they, they never have to contend with that in that kind of fundamentally sort of existential, I'm not saying that people of any sort of background don't have existential issues, but in that particular way, you know, we are surrounded by images that kind of reinforce the realness of a very particular subset of people. So the kind, the, when we talk about that we need diverse books, and we don't need just diverse books, we need diverse agents, editors, publishers, sort of gatekeepers in all, in all aspects. We also, we also need more of you know, fiction and art that is commensurate to the realities that we're actually living. And if you write bad stuff, guaranteed readers will come to you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I just wanted to respond to you. <laughs> yes. um, when I was a kid, most people in the audience who are my age, which is like <coughs> 50 something, um, from the Philippines or from somewhere else in Asia will remember growing up with our school books which had uh, look here Jane Dick you know all of those <laughs> characters and loving those books growing up with books that we loved that didn't have faces that looked like us and I was one of those kids and I fell in love with books and I wanted to become an author but it was very clear from the books that I read that Filipinos were not allowed to be authors. and it was only when I came here to England when I realized that people could hear my story and that my stories were worthy of being uh, being between the pages of these <coughs> objects that I loved so much, books. And that was the only time that I tried. And to my surprise, audiences did want to read my story and they continue to do so. So there is hope. Um, there is a lot of, uh, there's a, there are a lot of issues, but I think we just have to have faith in our stories um, uh, and just keep telling them in every way that we can. I don't think in particular Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is not a, a reality to most people in, in England. But I think that certainly the stories of other, you know, there, it's so, it's so, we, are, we are so various. I did a, I did a, uh, a, uh, a workshop in Singapore a few years ago where I had a, I had a group of people who were from Thailand, uh, Macau, Hong Kong, China, uh, Taiwan, Philippines, uh, all over, and it was mind-boggling mm -hmm. because every single individual was fascinating and had so much to tell. And you think about all of these stories that are not making it out there, and you think of how we can enable that. If only, but we have to begin somewhere, and we are all the beginnings. This is this is the beginning of it. And thank you for organizing it, Christina. I think we have to end there. <laughs> Books side may now take their place over here. <laughs> <laughs>